Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And just a quick thing, I am open to second chances. So if y'all can get today's show to 100,000 likes, I will do a $5,000 giveaway. But you gotta do it in the first 24 hours. That's the only stipulation. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Maybe I'll throw in a throat punch as the cherry on top. But that said, let's just jump into it. And first up in some don't be stupid, stupid news, let's talk about this anti-vaxxer protest that happened yesterday. Because you had hundreds of anti-vax protesters outside of the BBC chanting, then things all of a sudden get violent. They try to storm the building, but they were unsuccessful for two reasons. One, you had a group that was scuffling with police, ultimately turning back as more officers arrived to restore peace. And two, once again, shocking. Uh, Apparently the anti-vaxxers once again botched their own research and weren't even outside the offices of BBC News. Turns out the company moved operations out of that building nearly a decade ago. With even the likes of Pierce Morgan tweeting, it's ITV's HQ now, you fucking imbeciles. But you still had some trying to defend the protesters by pointing out that the building they showed up to is still used to produce some non-news BBC shows. But the counter to that is, that makes no sense, you silly, silly fuckhead. The anti-vaxxers were specifically targeting BBC News because they promote the coronavirus vaccine. Right, not really sure what they accomplished by confusing Charlene White, who's uh, the host of an ITV show called Loose Women. She was actually in the building when the protesters arrived. In fact, she was so confused as to why the building was being targeted later tweeting. Not sure what protesters were hoping to achieve, but all they would have found was me, Jane, Nadia, and Penny on Loose Women talking about menopause. And as far as an official response right from the BBC, they've actually declined to comment on the situation, but you did have Andrew Neal, a former BBC host and center-right media entrepreneur, writing possibly the best outro to this story. Is there a link between stupidity and anti-vax? Opinions vary, but evidence is growing. Also, if you've recently come out of the woodwork and uh, specifically regarding the anti-vax stuff, been like, wow, Phil, you're revealing yourself to be an asshole. It's not a secret. I've been a public professional asshole for 15 years. I just used to be your asshole, but then I stopped talking to you and I started talking about you, so I was no longer yours. Love your face, moving on. Then, you know what, let's knock out a bunch of requested quickies. Starting with, maybe you've seen some headlines like, Floyd Mayweather snubbed Logan Paul knockout as he didn't want to hurt YouTube star. With it being reported that Mayweather's cousin said he didn't want to hurt Logan Paul. He's not a boxer, why would he want him to get hurt and not be able to go home and talk to his family? Floyd loves the sport that he's been involved in, but he also hates what comes with the damage that comes after the sport is over. And that may have been reported in the UK, but I can smell the bullshit from here. Like it's almost universally understood. Yes, both men got a big W getting paid, but because he didn't get dropped, Logan came out looking amazing from that fight. And if anything, it hurt the legacy of Floyd Mayweather, which, hey, to to Mayweather's credit, legacy doesn't put food on the table. Yeah, there's not a doubt in my mind that Mayweather cares more about his ego and his legacy than Logan Paul's health. Also, as far as entertainers, you had Pokimane in the news because she recently talked about burnout. Right in a vlog style video explaining, you know, even though she's like so successful and so massive when she's offline, she's constantly thinking. Even though I had such a great day off, there is always a little bit that sentiment of like, Should I stream? Okay, well, I'm playing games off stream. Should I stream now? And it is just so hard to properly enjoy your time off without thinking that you should or could be doing more. If you can stream 20 hours a day, every single day, it's probably good for your channel. But is it good for you? Is it what you're gonna be happy about on your deathbed years from now? Probably not. And oftentimes the thing that is motivating these people to go live every single day continuously Is the fear of falling off, is the desire for more, is the sentiment of inadequacy. And adding that the praise that people get when they overwork, whether it be on Twitch or whatever, it promotes a very unhealthy lifestyle. And ultimately, my opinion with this is I largely agree, but also, you know, different strokes, different folks. And while I don't believe that there's gonna be universal empathy for for a a streamer that makes multi-million dollars a year, I do believe that there can be some universal things said here. One, money, yes, is important. It opens up opportunities, it provides security, but also past a certain point, it is not the end all be all because two whether you love or hate your job you are ultimately exchanging your time your life for money or like i could just flip a switch and make the philip defranco show seven days a week make pretty much twice as much money as i'm making now but i would be miserable or like i love my job but it's not my everything and only like my sons are seven and three they're never gonna be those ages again i'm never gonna have this time again time is the ultimate depleting resource respect that before it's too late but three not everyone is the same or like i couldn't have gotten to the place where i'm at now if i didn't overwork when i was younger and the only thing that i cared about in my life was my professional success I think it's just important to realize that you cannot sprint forever. It can be very useful, it can be very 
fruitful, but it's not sustainable. Like I 100% pride myself on how hard I had to work and hustle and grind in my 20s, but I wouldn't want that to be my normal in my 30s. And I think that's why, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I, I've seen a number of people either burn out or they, they try to have crutches and oftentimes that, that ends up being substance abuse. So yeah, I think where I wanna end, cause I have gotten a little rambly here. I think a lot of this is all about finding balance, what feels healthy to you, which also means you need to do a really hard thing. It sounds easy, very hard actually listen to yourself. Don't base your decisions on other people's successes, your fears. I mean, operating from a place of fear is already like a losing battle. But yeah, I don't know, while this was a quickie, it's also not a simple story because it's not like, here are just the facts, like a feelings thing, what's the goal or point of life thing. I, I wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts regarding the, this topic? But from that, let's take a quick second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Vessi. You know, honestly, it is hard to find lightweight shoes that actually keep your feet warm and dry through rain, snow, mud, and Vessi definitely surprised me with these. Vessi makes 100% waterproof and snowproof sneakers that are incredibly comfortable, breathable, and actually pretty stylish. Personally, I wear both their Cityscape sneakers and their latest release, the Weekend Shoe, and their Dimatex material is a dual climate knit that keeps you cool in the summer and warm in the winter, which truly makes this the everyday sneaker, even for the wet season, right? Because these shoes are perfect for traveling, easy to pack, ready for any weather, or, you know, just running errands, going to the gym, going to the park, going on muddy hikes, whatever. And with a weekend shoe, you can just rinse them off or even just throw them right into the washing machine. It is that easy. So be sure to grab some now while they still have your size and you'll be thanking me later. Just go to vessi.com slash defranco right now and be sure to use code defranco at checkout to get $25 off. Then we got to witness something that doesn't normally happen. The Senate actually did something. Voting today 69 to 30 to pass the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package. And while yes, there are reports saying this will face an uphill battle in the House, it's still something. 19 Senate Republicans, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, actually voted with Democrats. But notably, still a good number of Republicans not in support of this, including Senator Rick Scott of Florida, who have criticized the bipartisan bill as a first step to pave the way for the Democrats' $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, which, as places like Axios have noted, the Senate will now immediately move to consider. But uh, once again, there they have to do so without losing a single Democrat vote, and there, there's always two people that come to mind, so we'll see. But main thing, the Senate did a thing. And then let's talk about California because some craziness is about to go down. Right, so just around the corner, we have the recall election of California Governor Gavin Newsom. And wow, Democrats need to be worried. Right, so some quick background here. Back in April, state officials announced that a Republican-led effort had garnered more than the necessary 1.4 million signatures to prompt a recall election of Newsom, with the California Secretary of State eventually verifying over 1.7 million of the 2.1 million signatures collected by organizers. And supporters of the recall have cited a number of reasons that they desire to get rid of Newsom, including the state's high taxes, the homelessness crisis, and the governor's position on hot button issues like immigration. But also this effort really gained momentum during the pandemic, which was largely driven by Republican opposition to his handling of the crisis, and specifically the shutdowns of schools and businesses as well as the state's vaccine rollout. But Newsom for his part has painted the recall as a political stunt led by Trump supporters, and for months the effort seemed like a complete long shot. But now, just a little over a month before the September 14th election, polls show Newsom is facing an actual serious threat. With, for example, a poll published August 4th by Survey USA and the San Diego Union Tribune finding that 51% of respondents were in favor of recalling Newsom, while only 40% wanted to keep him in power. And that is incredibly notable because yes, while you do have places like Real Clear Politics saying the average of the polls that they've had recently, it's much closer. A poll conducted back in May by the same organizations that found an 11 point split now found then just 36% support of the recall with 47% opposing it. That is a drastic shift. Also, further complicating matters for Newsom is the fact that polls have also consistently shown a big enthusiasm gap among Democrats, with nearly 90% of Republicans expressing a high level of interest in this recall election, but for Democrats, the number is around 58%, for independents, 53%. Meaning, even though California is usually thought to be a lock for Democrats, Republicans here are far more likely to drive turnout. Beyond that, there are also a number of other hurdles that the governor faces. Or like many other governors, right now, Newsom is facing a surge in COVID cases driven by the Delta variant, which has hurt not only his on the ground campaign efforts, but it also means that there's now increased scrutiny from both sides over how he is handling the surges. But beyond that, another problem for Newsom, they're just piling up. There are also concerns that there's gonna be confusion with the voting. And that's because the ballot will ask two questions, both of which experts are worried could trip up voters. The first question, shall the governor be recalled, will be answered by a vote of yes, he should, or no, he should not. And so you have political analysts say that could create a problem that is often the case with yes or no questions on 
on ballots. Finding that sometimes voters who wish to oppose a policy or politician will vote no on their ballot and vice versa for those who wish to support and yes. And then the second question will ask voters to select a candidate that they wish to replace Newsom. And while that is more straightforward, the Democrats messaging on this has not been. Right, Newsom's camp has told people to leave the second question blank and that simply voting no on the first question is quote, the only way to block the Republican power grab and prevent a Republican takeover of California. But that's not technically true. Out of the 46 candidates challenging Newsom, nine are Democrats, three are affiliated with a minor party and 10 are no party preference. So as a result, Democratic strategists worry that if Newsom is ousted successfully, a new governor could be chosen by just a fraction of the electorate. Because big thing with recall elections, while you do need a majority of the vote to recall the governor, you only need a plurality to elect a successor. Right? Literally the way this could legally work out, let's say Newsom gets uh, recalled by two votes. There's not some other election that happens. If let's say all the votes for then the second question, it's just a scatter shot. A candidate in this field of 46, they get the most votes and it's only like 10% they become the governor. And so as far as who would replace Newsom, while there is a very crowded field, so far polls have shown that conservative talk radio host Larry Elder is leading the Republicans by a fairly solid margin. While on the other end, YouTuber and real estate broker Kevin Paffrath leads among the Democrats challenging Newsom. But also of note, the polling here is all over the damn place. Well, the recent poll from UC Berkeley and the LA Times showed Paffrath polling behind four Republicans with just 3% of respondents saying that he was their first choice. The San Diego Union Tribune survey actually showed him leading even above Elder with 27% of those who said that they supported ousting Newsom. And two things that I'll say with this story. Uh, one, uh, right now my schedule's crazy, but we're trying to get uh, Kevin on the show sometime this week. And two, it is, it is truly astonishing, it is amazing how much the Democratic establishment has shit the bed here. That they were like, ah, who needs a plan B? Well, apparently you now. They didn't throw some backup prominent Dem on the ticket. You have the, the party chair of the California Dem saying vote nothing on the second question. And right now, based on the polling, they could just be handing Republicans the state. So how about this as a backup plan, you fucking idiots? Tell your Democrat supporters to vote no on the recall, but for question two, write in Philip DeFranco. I have no actual desire to be the governor of California. I'm exhausted with my life as is, and it's pretty tame. And on day one, I will resign because there's no reason that 17% of the vote or some bullshit like that should select the governor of a fucking state. It's just, <laughs> it's all just crazy. But yeah, I mean, joking aside, I, I do think the Democrats do need to change their plans. Say, yeah, vote no to question one, but have a fucking backup. Because not only will this affect California, I didn't even get to the best or the scariest part, depending on which side of the political aisle you, you sit. If the Dems fail to get their base to go out and vote no, it is very likely that a Republican will take power. And then there's a concern that Democratic Senator Feinstein might have retirement plans or there could be a health issue, at which point the then Republican governor could put forward a Republican senator and flip the Senate. So you just look at some of the messaging and you're like, are you trying to lose? And then finally, I mean, I talked about willfully and wanting to resign, uh, but today we also heard from a man that did not want to resign, but now has. I would never want to be unhelpful in any way. And I think that given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And therefore that's what I'll do. And my resignation will be effective in 14 days. Right, so in the wake of his sexual harassment scandal following accusations from multiple women, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo just announced this morning that he is resigning in two weeks. And while Cuomo has consistently denied those allegations for months and refused to step down initially, this comes after State Attorney General Letitia James released a scathing report on the governor last week. And so as far as what is going to happen from here, Cuomo announced that Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul will be taking over. And notably there, she's been very distant with Cuomo, even saying that James's report documented repulsion and unlawful behavior by the governor and that no one is above the law. You know, that distance, it will likely prove useful if not be completely needed because I mean, there's a lot of fallout around Cuomo. But also that said, Cuomo isn't automatically free from these accusations now. He still faces legal threats from criminal investigations, including potential sexual harassment charges as well as potential civil cases. And I mean, it's important not to forget that right now, federal investigators are also looking at how his administration's handling of nursing home data led to thousands of COVID-related deaths going uncounted. As well as the fact 
Jessica James is investigating whether Cuomo used state resources to fund his pandemic memoir. So while yes, the governor is resigning, the shit show is not over. So ultimately with this story or really anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because yes, this is a news show, but it's also a conversation. So maybe while you're leaving that comment down below, I'll leave you as I always do. Thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, all the good stuff. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.